Hello all, welcome to the Lunar Sea Spire Cartoon Fan Podcast. This is episode 348, and today we'll be talking about germs from Invader Zen. I'm GC13. And I'm David. Now, funny story about germs. Germs was actually the first episode of Invader Zen I saw any of, so I didn't see it the whole way through, I just saw a part of it playing in the middle there. So, it took several episodes for me to realize that being a clean freak was not just part of Zim's character. That was something he was doing in a single episode. Well, I'm surprised that's the only takeaway. My takeaway was (laughs) a quintessential part of Zim's character, which is that he screams. And he screams a lot. And he'll scream every episode. We get a lot of great Zim blood-curling screams in this one. Oh yeah, that's, uh, that's something I noticed. Uh, very early on in my Invader Zim tenure is that it's not a Zim episode unless there's a lot of screaming in it. These are these are very clean, just genuine fear screams, which are wonderful. <laughs> uh, the premise for this is incredibly simple. Zim just watches a, a B movie plot about aliens that apparently have terrible allergies because they explode the moment any kind of microorganism touches them at all, which is pretty bad. And at first I was thinking, are the Urkins just, are they completely unfamiliar with germs and this is just shocking to him? But for some reason, Zim has not been cultured on this because his computer system is completely aware of germs being on every planet, but I guess they're not on Urk because... It's kind of like a synthetic world anyway, and the only biological creatures they have are themselves. Well, it says every planet has them, so I think that it's not native germs that are the real killer. Yeah, but also, I don't know, Urk seems really post-biological. There's not really anything else going on there except uh... for, you know, Urkins, who are... All all Urkin planets are incredibly sterile, so... Yeah, the Urkins could feasibly have... Very, very weakened immune systems, but Zim, Zim seems to handle everything okay, so... <laughs> no, that's the thing. I guess the Pax manage it. Yeah, the, no, the premise is he's been completely fooled, just like Spongebob really thought Mr. Krabs was a robot from, you know, a crappy movie. Which this is apparently just a common experience of kids watching a movie late at night and then thinking that, that their world is now the movie. So I guess that translates to kids' cartoons really easily. Guess Zim's not immune, even though he is over 100 years old. He's definitely, I mean... Just because of Gur's presence, we know that <laughs> this would have been a problem from the very start of Earth. But yeah, this one stuck out in my mind also because this was the first one of the early, you know, another Nick game. So we talked about with, you know, the yeah, body yeah. invasion episode that that also had a pretty unique 3D Flash game that we then found out after the podcast episode was made with some weird variant of Flash in order to achieve the 3D graphics. And so even if you want to emulate it today, you can't quite. No, no, no. You can you can emulate it. You can emulate it just fine. It's just that SWF files are much more common than... I, I can't remember the extension yeah, this one had. It requires... But it was made with Macromedia. Yeah. Like okay. Shockwave, I think it was. So it's just a Shockwave file, not, a, not an Adobe Flash. Yeah. So the Germs one is much more standard and exactly what you'd expect. I actually didn't look up the name for it, but the game premise is literally just... You see germs spray them with the disinfectant spray, you know, doesn't doesn't take a lot. They definitely needed to rake in some ad money from Nick.com from that game back in the day, because this is another episode that needlessly pulls in a whole, like, ten seconds of CGI that they didn't need to do, Ooh. and that work was ridiculously expensive. So, And the premise for it is great, because, okay, so Zim's, you know, learning about the germs, he pulls up a demo of... The germ visualizing goggles, which is also hilarious. It lasts because... for like almost 15 seconds, even though it's only a five second demo. So, <laughs> right. It's the screams that really makes it uh, last in time longer for Zim. Yeah, I just love the setup is so simple. You know, there's gentle retail music. And then as soon as he puts on the glasses, it's just torture and then they zap away. But yeah, even though apparently they have some kind of virtual matter transportation slash materialization system it's like they they foresaw 3d printers and then added a few thousand years of iteration on top of them yeah and and then they still have a giant delivery planet which we you know go to and of course this is the only time this model for this planet is used and all of its inner machinations 
which is awesome. I mean, maybe they reused some of the tubing for it, but we just get a ridiculously detailed view at this delivery planet that then shoots the same pair of goggles back out to Zim's house in a meteorite, which is wonderful. And I, every time I see CGI in the show, I just think of how Jonan said, guys, it'll be cheaper. <laughs> and then you're like, this planet never gets reused. This is not a thing. So your mind basically goes to Nanafwa. I trust this man. <laughs> that somehow they trusted that 22-year-old kid, and it was it was fantastic. Just let Jonen do it for you. <laughs> also, so, you know, CGI, always like looking at it. The, the deep lore this time around is um, surprisingly not about the burger meat, although there, we do learn quite a bit about McMeaty's history and their inability to spend money on space meat. But uh, the squealy spooch is mentioned here. Yeah. It's very casually. Yeah. Learn a little bit about the organs, which we'll, uh, you know, immediately find out in the episode it's paired with. Dark Harvest airs after this one. So right. this is our first mention of the squiggly scooch in airing order. Right. Just to give you a little, little, uh, kind of like, um, what's it called at the beginning of the orchestra? You hear all the music before you, before you hear all the music. You're getting a little foreshadowing, but not foreshadowing. It's like we, we use the term and then it's It's like a familiar. prelude or something. Yeah, yeah. It's familiar the next time you, you hear it. Now, you you talk about deep lore. I want to talk about, I think that in this episode, Invader Zim actually accidentally undercuts its dark corporate dystopia that the humans <laughs> live in. Because you saw that one spray can of disinfectant, and you saw how long Zim was using that <laughs> one spray can. They're surprisingly generous. Even when it's down to its last dregs, he still has enough to make it... He, he must have been going for, like, at least an hour down the street to that <laughs> store. So, like, say what you will, but they provide the consumer goods to their consumers. You know, we're not dressed in rags and working for our corporate overlords. We're getting the gilded cage, baby. Okay, but we'll assume that the spray either has horrible untested side effects on, you know, human skin and, uh, you know, its potential to develop cancer. What are you talking about this? We tested this on baby animals, and we have no idea what it does to humans. <laughs> exactly. I, I refuse to believe that there's just a really nice disinfectant spray company out there in Zim's world. Not when... <laughs> not when Mikimedes is making uh, freaking <laughs> burger patties out of used napkins, which I love that whole backstory and how very quickly it changes, like, we're talking so long about space meat. Just the gag that Zim even looks at a burger and it has no germs on it is already great. And then the fact that a random old employee behind the counter is uh, apparently appropriately named Burger Lord by Zim because he actually knows the whole history of how the corporate... He's probably a long timer there. He was probably working there when they first introduced the not space meat patties. Right. I just love that he goes on this whole story about how they're was investigation by scientists into space meat and <laughs> it was a you know not a financially viable thing so yeah oh well i i liked i like seeing vasquez and steve russell uh sitting there working on their script for the nightmare begins oh see every time i see their background characters i'm reminded that i think it was jonan who said that he hated them <laughs> being put into episodes what? like that's a thing that other artists did and he hated being self-inserted into the episode. Either him or his partner that you saw there. Well, he has the best character model on the show, so he has to be in there. Right, it's it's cute, but he hated that. He he did not want to be in there, if I recall correctly. Jonan, feel free to come on the podcast to correct that. But um, it, as the last I remember, he just found it uh, distasteful. It's like, make a cartoon, don't do self-inserts. Okay, so does this mean he's not a fan of Susie from Summer Camp Island? Because this might be a deal breaker. <laughs> is that is that your self insert, GC? Don't voice a major. No, she's. The, oh, you mean because she vo because Julia Potts voices? Yeah, her. yeah, but it's not the it's not the same. Like it's more along the lines of when people were out crying about that in the Powerpuff Girls reboot. That one person that inserted themselves as like a self obsessed fan. In, in the show? I I don't know. Eh. It's just putting cameos of the cast is 
you know, fine. But definitely Vasquez's character especially stands out episode to episode, and that might have also made him a little more uh, yeah. annoyed by it over time. No, they just they just did such a good job on him. Yeah. I, I liked the, the baby being one giant germ. <laughs> yeah, someone someone has a definite opinion on, on babies. <laughs> I mean, how old was Shonen when this uh this episode came out? <laughs> there you go. I think we know who it was. I also like the actual baby germ that <laughs> Sim kills oh. in his house after like three v- vicious rounds. Hey, that was very responsible. If that one if that one had survived, it would have went on to breed an entire generation of disinfectant resistant super germs. So he did the right thing. Absolutely. When the when the meteor came crashing down, I was expecting them to do one of their gags where just somebody sees that that happened and is like, eh, seems normal. But they didn't. They saved that for the the old dude outside. I know. They actually have a character just kind of <laughs> pissed off at Zim screaming. And I love that Zim characters, like, they 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 pick, you know, humanity, and it's almost like, it's a weirdly kind of diverse show, and as far as, like, they show humans, like, this guy has no legs, right? But it's not like, I don't know, it's like their world is just very real, and it's not like, oh god, he's a disfigured, horrible man, it's just like, yeah, there's just a dude with no legs chilling out in this, outside, and he's also like, what's going on over there? That's kind of annoying. I, I love that. I don't know. Yeah, when I, when, I saw the, when I saw his reaction, I'm just thinking, that kid ain't right. <laughs> or I guess we could go with Steven Universe. That kid keeps getting weirder. <laughs> At least someone's reacting to Zim. I'm surprised his classmates even remembered him. <laughs> you know, they're, they're gonna notice any second at school that I'm gone, and I, I can't believe there were even two kids talking about Zim. So, so how long was Zim, like, just in his base cleaning up? Like, was that just, just for the day, and he only missed one day of school? Because he talked about not having reported into the tallest for a while, so does he report into them daily, or was he cleaning for longer, or what? I, I you know, timey, timey-wimey. Yeah, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey. His, uh, the, 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 the tallest this time in just explicit terms were like, maybe we should have sent him to the sun. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Why did, why did we entertain this? Yeah, send him to one of those exploding head planets. <laughs> and then they're generally, g- genuinely afraid of his, of his message. It's just, uh, <laughs> classic tallest, classic tallest. Uh, that, that was pretty disturbing. I mean, if I just saw that sight unseen... You know, if I had no idea what was going on in Zim's life, and then he calls me up to to give me this, I'd be like, yeah, that was pretty disturbing, actually. <laughs> but, you know, we, we haven't talked about, we, we've talked about what's happened in the episode, but we haven't talked about what happens after the episode. Because the episode ends with Zim having his protective suit of burgers around him to protect him from the germs. But... Let's see, which episode was it where the tallest are reminiscing about the, what happened after this? And the we know that the meat will eventually invade his eye sockets and nearly render him blind. So there's something interesting going on with that meat. It's not just napkins. They do other stuff to it. What, doesn't Zim also have, like, really gross skin reactions to being covered in meat? Isn't that a thing at some point? Well, it's not actual meat. It's, uh, it's napkins. So <laughs> Yes, right. My bad. Also, I think this is after the wetting, so... No, no, because the, the baloney will still get him through the glue. Hmm. Okay, I don't know. I just don't know, David. There is no strong continuity in Zim, by the way. <laughs> in, case, uh, in case anyone was wondering. Um, you know, are we watching different timelines? I don't even think it's that. I think, uh, I feel like the creators of the show would just describe it as it's literally a cartoon. <laughs> yep. Well, it's a cartoon. That's what Zim's trying to reinforce it on on some level. Yeah. Well, hey, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Even even if it did take me a little while to pick up on the fact that Germs is just a weird episode, Zim isn't normally all about cleanliness. As you said, he's all about screaming. <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta keep a through line for the important character traits. Oh, uh, especially with the uh, filthy filthy girl. I'm. 
kind of surprised that he didn't think that, okay, where's Gur? I'm going to have to sanitize him first, like, as the most disgusting thing in my house. But, you know, Zim was clearly not thinking rationally. That, uh, that five-second demo that was more than five seconds tapped into that deep consumer lizard brain of his. <laughs> yeah. Which surprisingly had a lot of synergy with, with Earth products. Unless he bought all that disinfectant spray from Irk, I wouldn't be surprised if they sold more products with English labels on them. You know, why not? No, I didn't see a single Invader logo on there, and we know when he has his space soda, it has the Invader logo on it to let you know why he's not being poisoned by the food, because it's not Earth food. Fair enough. There is, there is one more final complaint that I have to say about the scientific accuracy of that movie that they were watching at the beginning. I think that that lady, that scientist lady, is wrong. I don't think it's the germs that the aliens are allergic to, because, I mean, clearly it, it's based off of War of the Worlds, in case anyone doesn't know, where the aliens die to germs rather than our militaries. And so they do the same thing here, except it's our militaries using the germs against them. But it's like, why send soldiers out to cough on them? There are germs all over the place. I think it's human saliva that the aliens are allergic to. That's why you have to go cough on them. That's a beautiful theory. That really, I, I've been watching some uh, SDCC panels because I just finished the Venture Bros. And I just, now I'm going back and being like, oh, yeah, let's watch interviews. And that's the type of thing where a fan walks up to the mic at SDCC for some random show, <laughs> and they're like, so I have this theory that actually in your completely fictional movie, at the start of one of your ancient-ass episodes of your show, that uh, it was actually saliva that they were allergic to, because you, you don't actually write stories in your cartoon. You actually channel the real existence of another world that I have determined the reality of greater than you. <laughs> oh, writers. I'm glad you understand. I mean, like, it, it is going awfully meta. We're analyzing <laughs> what is clearly meant to be a B movie within a cartoon. So no. like, it's not even meant to be a it's not even meant to be a good movie. It's not even meant to be the kind of movie that would care about scientific accuracy. And yet I still feel compelled to make the observation. <laughs> no, it's it's wonderful. Well, someday I hope you get the opportunity to bring that. In front of the creators <laughs> of an actual show and say it with full determination and see just how much they hold back their disappointment <laughs> and confusion. I don't think there's a pocket protector big enough in the entire <laughs> world for me to be wearing. So we might just have to leave that comment uh, for the podcast and for the Twitter. So fair enough. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, time to evacuate all the podcasters. Anyway, guys, that's been us on Germs. Join us next week. Until then, I'm GC13. And I'm David. Uh, you know, am I just going to keep begging now? We're two, ways, two, two reviews away from 100 reviews on Apple Podcasts. So, uh, you know, any kind of review will take us there. Woo! Later, everybody. Our opening and closing music is by Mark Soto. For more cartoon-related content, please visit LunarCeasefire.com.